so the, the paper I'm going to present is called Meaning Change and Changing Meaning. Um, and thanks everybody for coming to this here last session. I think there are going to be some interesting points of contact between this talk and the previous talk. So maybe that's something that can come up in the Q&A or the round table. Um, and so what I'm going to do in the talk is sketch a way to extract some generalizations about semantic change that are relevant to the feasibility question that we've all been discussing. Um, and the whether or not you, well, um, the basic, sorry. So basically the sort of background picture is that usage evolves according to um, communicative pressures. So while individuals usage may be complex and chaotic um, and very difficult to predict, we can extract generalizations about the total mosaic of usage that are relevant to the feasibility question. So, um, Sometimes this observation that a word's use is inexhaustible um, is parlayed into some bad news for conceptual engineering. Um, it's supposed to, you know, it's meant to show that the how dark the relationship is between meaning and use and how difficult it is to control speakers on a kind of scale conceptual engineers are liable to care about. And we could see that in Capellan. Um, and sometimes the sort of complexity and cha chaoticness of use is parlayed into good news. Um, and the thought is, is that, you know, you, you can practice good conceptual hygiene. We can speak as we see best, stipulatively or not, um, and influence those around us to do the same. There's nothing that bars that possibility. Um, and the thought is, well, you know, hack your mind, um, expose yourself to better representations and represent better in turn. And I think both of these responses to the kind of inexhaustibility of use that's sometimes observed are too quick. And um, I think, yes, usage is complex and chaotic um, and speaker behavior is mal malleable too, but um, there are these kinds of generalizations about what sorts of usages are likely to catch on. Um, and that's where we can find some partial answers to the feasibility questions. So I'm gonna go through some positive and negative lessons, but first um, I'm gonna say some more general things about meaning and linguistics. Um, so onward. So um, we can all observe that girl and myriad, words girl and myriad as used in Chaucer's day um, have changed since changed their meaning. Girl once applied to children of any sex and myriad, the quantity 10,000 entered English through Latin, which came through Greek. Um, and this sort of mundane sense in which we can observe this a whole bunch of areas of linguistics and lexicography suppose that there are meanings in this sense, this mundane sense. Um, and psycholinguistics, cognitive linguistics, generative linguistics, um, game theoretic linguistics, arguably these different, I'm not arguably, these different areas of linguistics have very different kinds of theoretical commitments, but more or less they tend to agree on observations about meaning change. So we can just, I suppose these are le legitimate disciplines. Um, conceptual engineers can rely on meaning of this sort and put on hold some of these much more fraught questions about the relationship between use and meaning, how best to theorize meanings, the relationship between intentions and mental representations, what structure these representations take and so on. Um, and to get a partial answer to the feasibility question I'm suggesting um, is th this, this, the sense in which girl and married have changed their meaning. That is the sense of meaning that we need. Um, and so we can set aside, you know, different kinds of conceptual engineering progress projects may target different kinds of entities, linguistic competence, anchors of linguistic competence, mental representations. We can just set that aside. Um, and we can just ask which expressions are likely to catch on. Um, and how far can we get with that idea? And I think actually really pretty far, there's a huge wealth of data um, just sitting in like say the Oxford English Dictionary and in any number of areas of linguistics. There's um, contemporary, so there's a tradition that, and this has come up at other moments in the conference, there's a sort of long tradition of historical semantics um, from Bloomfeldians that has waned, but um, there's a lot of contemporary linguistics literature also, and a lot, it's, it's small, but it's growing, and it's in, driven in part by booming interest in cognitive, in grammaticalization and cognitive linguistics literature, and that's, you know, we can, Find, you could look at Eve Sweetser's work or neo Gricean approaches to the semanticization of pragmatics and inference. And that's, you know, Horn and Kleinhelder, those are good examples. Um, other attempts to theorize semantic change loom large in sociolinguistics, 
Um, so you like Eckert and Lubav, right? Um, and in game theory, and increasingly in game theoretic semantics, although there's not that much at the moment, there's also increasingly like corpus studies and right. Okay, so um, optimality pragmatics formalizes and extends Gricean principles of semantic change. Um, the idea is that um, when we speak, there's a kind of cooperative communicative behavior that's happening. Um, and this model can also be regarded as producing default and presumed interpretations. And so I'm gonna draw on some of those ideas um, to suggest a way to approach um, conceptual engineering and the feasibility question um, and some useful illuminate, you know, generalizations. But what I'm gonna say is I think I think actually pretty theoretically light. Um, so let's just, Back up for a second. So as I'm understanding it, so, so we've got the total mosaic of usage. These are all the expressions issued in the head and out loud in doctor's offices and seminar rooms, law rooms and picnics. Um, and this is just changing all the time, right? The total mosaic of usage just shifts a lot. Um, and conceptual engineers want to alter some band of it. So for example, um, well, so some of the ways it shifted is we talk, you know, there's less uses of typewriter than there used to be in falconry vocabulary. Um, there's less uses of girl meaning child of either sex. In fact, there are very few, except when we're talking about say semantic change or reading Chaucer. Um, and there've been some gains. So now we talk, now we use the expression laptop meaning laptop and girl meaning girl, right? And the conceptual engineer hopes to alter the usage of some word meaning something in particular in this mundane sense of meaning. Um, and maybe to shrink the usage of one expression and to replace it with the usage of another in some band of discourse. Um, and this sort of thing isn't all that exotic, right? New theoretical terms are often introduced um, into expert discourse and even among a few friends is you know, a joke or nicknaming, right? Um, it's not so hard to do. It's again, trickier to figure out what you're likely to catch on. So I think the situation is really not very different from other complex chaotic systems. So we can think about which widgets are gonna sell in the economy. So what's gonna be this year's hit toy? Um, and the economists and marketers think they have some partial ability to predict the answer to that. Um, so likewise, take another complex chaotic system, foot traffic. Um, so here we have on the left, like a path of desire where, you know, lots of walkers take the, take an efficient route or people forming a circle around street performers. Now it might be that, you know, predicting where individual walkers go is a losing, it's a losing battle. It's very hard to do that. Um, but in general, we can come up with some principles. Why? Um, well, cause pedestrian foot traffic is sensitive to some underlying principles. Don't look super rude. So, you know, don't stand in front of too many other people if you want to get a good view, try to get a good view. Minimize the effort you have to take and the distance you're going. So it would be harder to climb over that fence on the bottom left than it would be to just take a slightly less, less of a shortcut, but it's an easier road to, to travel. Okay, you guys get the point. Um, and you know, economists come up with this, marketers come up with things like this. Okay, so, and economists have plenty to say about pressures that drive purchasing behavior, right? So they make generalizations sometimes with an eye toward shaping them, right? So notice that people like to buy all other things being equal, people like to buy cheaper, cheaper doodads. Um, so make a tax on imports if you want to sell, you know, non, non imported goods for trying to stimulate the economy. So um, again, so we're gonna to try to extract some generalizations for the conceptual engineer with an eye towards shaping usage. So you can think of usage like foot traffic as reflecting a balance of a variety of communicative pressures. Um, and the fact that we speak to achieve certain goals is critical to understanding language change. And this is not a new <laughs> observation. People have been talking about this since you know 1860 or so. Um, and sometimes these goals are shared, so coordinating our plans and sometimes not, like social advancement, right? Um, so in pursuit of these goals, speakers observe various rough rules, right? The most familiar the, of them to philosophers are the Gricean maxims, um, but there are others. Um, and so conversational goals aren't just advanced by, you know, saying the right propositions, right? They're advanced by expressing them via the right words. So. Um, we can just talk through with some of these sort of pretty commonsensical background 
um, considerations are. So we like to speak in ways that are convenient, easily done, or we, rather just on the whole, usage, the broad mosaic of usage reflects, um, includes expressions that reflect a balance between being convenient, e you know, easily said, or efficient, have a good ratio of energy expended to the value of the message conveyed, or clear, as in they're unlikely to be misunderstood, or smooth, as in they're unlikely to raise irrelevant considerations that distract from the point, um, or transparent in that they make clear what, what's being addressed. They're not too, too opaque, too confusing. Um, they're flattering. They cast the speaker in the speaker's desired light. Um, and they're concordant. They fit in with the speaker's intended group, conversational group. So maybe um, that's being one of the cool kids, or maybe that's being unremarkable. And, and not having one's words draw particular attention. Um, so can we use these sorts of principles to issue some general, light, commonsensical explanations for some observed trends in language change? I think sure. So just get you in the mood. Um, the use of niggardly is clearly in decline. It's not a mystery why. It sounds like a slur, right? We tend to avoid words that are going to bring up untoward, predictably bring up untoward feelings or be misunderstood, right? Um, unless of course, that's exactly what we intend to do. Um, it's not surprising that the word myriad came to mean quite a lot when it originally started out meaning 10,000. Terms for large quantities very often go imprecise in just this way after becoming popular in stock metaphors, like a ton or a lot. Um, it stands to reason that easily pronounced abbreviations over time would be replaced, would replace the longer terms they abbreviate, like car came in, coming to replace carriage. Um, and, you know, language associated with youth culture is popular. Um, people speak in ways they want to be seen, so they try to seem funny or hip or young or right. Yeah, okay. Um, we know all of this. Certain expressions have a tendency to pejorate, acquire more negative meanings, blah, blah, blah. We can think of the euphemism treadmill um, where the word words for the bathroom have been introduced and successively replaced by terms that no longer have the sort of negative associations they acquired by being used for the bathroom. Um, but there are less obvious examples. Words for older women tend to pejorate, hag and crone. Words for the inexpensive, like cheap, vile, and shoddy tend to pejorate. Words for the average, like mediocre, common, I mean, okay, blah, 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 blah. Um, words on the whole tend to pejorate, get more negative associations than they do tend to ameliorate, get more positive associations. Those are terms that linguists categorizing semantic change use. So it's coincidental that conceptual amelioration um, uses the same word. Okay, so, um, so here's, so are there some that are gonna be relevant to the, some such generalizations that we can explain they're gonna be relevant to conceptual engineering and I think there are plenty. Um, I'm gonna start with some negative lessons. Um, there are plenty more than I've said here, but here, here are some. I'm gonna start with some negative lessons and then quickly apply them to some of the proposals in the literature to just get a feel for how this goes. And then I'll say some positive lessons. So it's not all bad news. It's just, um, I think the proposals that tend to be feasible are gonna be a lot less exciting than the ones that philosophers hope for. Um, and that's not necessarily bad, it's just um, somewhat different than um, theoretically rich hopes might suggest. Okay, so let's just move through some, some negative lessons. It's well documented that natural languages have a tendency to avoid clashing homonyms. By this, I mean terms with the same a lexical item that are liable to be used in areas of discourse where it's confusing. So for example, we can think of sheet in a printer's office, sheet at um, a, sh a, a linen store and sheet on a yacht. Um, you're not gonna talk about sheets on a yacht um, in a way where you're expecting to you know, saliently and transparently communicate talk about bed sheets, unless you're already in the bed sheet conversation, but you're probably gonna start by talking about bed sheets. And so this is, you know, you can, there's some corpus data on this and people, people write about this. Um, and you can see in natural languages how we, there are often lexical changes that go with trying to distinguish. So the difference between brothers and brethren or um, fair mind, like is something funny? Well, is it funny ha ha or like funny weird? 
And we make these distinctions when there's liable to be classing. Okay, so um, example of clashing homonyms where um, I think this is particularly relevant to the conceptual engineer. Here's a beloved example in 12th century Gascon, France. Um, Caddis and Gallus. Caddis was used for cats, Gallus for roosters. They came to both be um, the, the word forms blended. So we got Gallus, Gattis. Um, and that was really confusing in a farming context, right? Because you, you want your audience to know, am I talking about roosters or cats? Um, and very, very quickly, um, Gattis got abbreviated to Gat, used only for cats, and three new words entered to pick out roosters. Um, so why is this relevant to the conceptual engineer? Um, basically, the thought is, is that insofar as the conceptual engineer is working with familiar expressions, it would behoove her to know that she's maybe setting herself up for a little bit of a hard time um, because conflicting libel, you know, confusable homonyms used in the, same, in the same area of discourse tend to be unstable. One tends to drop, sometimes both drop. Um, now, something good could happen. They could divide the field. So like with sheet, sheet, and sheet, we talk about in the bedroom, we talk about sheets on the bed, in the yacht, we talk about sheets on the, uh, as sails, you know, um, and so on. And so, for example, if the conceptual engineer is hoping to propagate the expression woman meaning has female gender identity, um, it's likely that it could, and, and, as, as indeed it seems to have, um, divided the total mosaic of usage with woman meaning woman in its ordinary meaning, assuming those two things are different. Um, and what we could see is happening, and arguably this has happened, is woman meaning has female gender identity is popularized in conversations where trans women are particularly salient or issues of gender identity are particular sal particularly salient. But if we're at the doctor's office or if we're in a bar or we're gesturing at a woman down the street um, and says, you know, where's the car parked? Oh, it's by that woman. Um, in that issuing of, of woman, in all likelihood, woman with its dominant meaning is going to continue to be the one issued because it's closer, closer to salience. Um, okay, that's a thought. Maybe it's wrong. But anyway, clashing homonyms are an issue. So let's just quickly run through a few more of these. I'm checking on the time. We could just go on with these. Okay, so it's sometimes remarked. So Here's another one. Um, we tend to use expressions in a way that satisfy quote unquote communicative desires. That is usage is very, very finely calibrated to what we want to talk and think about, which is very sensitive to what we have talked and thought about in the past in ways that are not bound up necessarily with um, the projects conceptual engineers care so much about. So for example, um, we could take the word cheese. Originally it picked out farm cheese, like the soft, soft cottagey cheese cheese, um, cause that's the kind of cheese that there was. And then there was a boom in cheese making technology um, in the middle ages. And suddenly there were many different kinds of cheese um, and cheese then broadened, right? To apply to all these different sorts, cheese broadened to apply to these different sorts of concoctions. And very quickly, again, we get, um, like a, a wave of expressions for the soft cheese, farm cheese, cottage cheese, and on and on. Um, and so again, there's a sort of background worry that um, certain sorts of um, conceptual engineering projects that aim to um, destabilize terms that are currently occupying a, a pretty stable pervasive niche in usage um, are sensitive to some of our communicative desires, but are overlooking other ones that actually firmly hold these terms in place. So here's maybe a silly example. Um, often we use gendered vocabulary when we're trying to acknowledge somebody's basic humanity. Thanks, ma'am, at the post office or, um, yeah. So something like that, we, we can use gendered vocabulary in situations like that or Where's the car parked? Down by that woman over there. Um, did someone take your order? Oh, she already did. Um, and in cases like this, our communicative desires are bound up with a kind of low epistemic commitment. So like, 
the woman down the block or they're bound up with acknowledging someone's basic humanity, which are in ways that are not easily satisfied by appeal to more theoretically rich terms or other terms that are readily available in English to acknowledge somebody's some little piece of somebody's specificity. Okay, so that's that's me just gesturing at something, but I think the problem of communicative desires is reasonably clear and it's getting noted in the literature. I've been working on this project a long time. People have been, this one's been coming up more. Um, so here's another one. Loaded expressions tend to be replaced in usage by less loaded alternatives. By loaded, I mean terms that carry a kind of cognitive baggage or, or freight. So the euphemism treadmill where we introduce a euphemism for something awkward and then it acquires a negative patina of awkwardness itself. And then we drop it and introduce a shiny new term. And then it too acquires this patina and we drop it. Um, that's an example of loaded expressions being replaced by less loaded alternatives. But another classic example is, are actually the terms queer and gay. So queer was originally a term for the peculiar and then by euphemistic, euphemistic extension, it acquired the meaning unwell. And in turn, again, uh, drunk and then by the mid 20th century um, and it acquired, or really early 20th century, it had acquired um, euphemistic extension to same sex attraction. Um, and again, queer that, um, the sexual orientation associations with queer became salient enough that queer meaning peculiar got loaded. Um, it became use, using, you know, what queer weather we're having triggers potentially in an audience, sit, talk of what queer weather we're having triggers potentially in an audience, a feeling that somebody is trying to stick their neck out and speak a little edgily or a cluelessness of the present moment and whatever. And to that extent, it gets avoided. Use of queer when we're not trying to be distracting, at least in America, I think that it varies in different places. You see this sort of thing fluctuate, but again, this is pretty commonsensical. Um, how is this relevant to conceptual engineers? Well, if I was trying to propagate a term uh, for race, say, uh, or for race or for gender, like Sally Haslinger's, where, um, say, we um, ameliorate black to mean subordinated on the basis of perceived African ancestry, um, this expression is going to be loaded in ways that make it not suitable for use, say, at a child's birthday party. We're not going to want to express the proposition or be interpreted as potentially expressing the proposition or thinking the proposition. Happy birthday to your daughter. I hope she grows up to be a proud person subordinated on the basis of her per perceived African ancestry. We're not going to want to say that. So Hasslinger's terms might gain traction in theoretical discourse. Um, but they're unlikely to gain traction in theoretical discourse where, um, in fact, it is at issue what it is to be, say, Black, um, because we're going to want to turn, right? Okay. Um, so here's another one. Um, and I'm going to stop myself soon um, to, to move on with the talk and on to some positive lessons, but this list just keeps, it just keeps going. So um, we have the a phenomenon of folk etymology, um, where a term appears to have a particular sort of meaning gets reinterpreted by hearers that way and then used that way. And then people um, speak in ways assuming that their audience is going to have a particular, right? This is, there's a long tradition of trying to theorize language change by reference to the competing interests of speakers and hearers and folk etymologies have gotten a lot of traction um, around some of that. But anyway, so classic example, inflammable, right? Means liable to catch fire, can be inflamed, um, but hearers tend to interpret it um, as in meaning not. So people think, oh, it's not flammable. And like, you know, I think it was in 1913 that the American Fire Safety Bureau or whatever advised against using this word because, uh oh, fire. Um, and, you know, there are a million more examples like this. So the thought is, is that um, opaque expressions tend to be replaced by more transparent ones. One's liable not to be misunderstood. Why? Because terms tend to acquire the meaning associated with what people think they mean um, if it's on a big enough scale. So one way this shows up is if you have terms that are very theoretically loaded, when they start getting used in contexts where that background theory is not appreciated um, or is not shared or is forgotten as in the case of Galen medical vocabulary like sanguine, 
um, they often acquire a meaning associated with the one that they're used most saliently to communicate. Um, so Galen medical vocabulary writes sanguine meant an excess of the blood humor um, associated with an excess of optimism. Um, mostly now when we talk about sanguine, pe people having a sanguine disposition, we're talking about their optimistic, their perhaps giddy optimism or something. We're not invoking this sort of larger background theory. Sanguine in, in Galen's sense gets used in discussions of Galen. Um, so again, we get a sort of dividing of the total mosaic of usage. So, you know, and philosophers talk about begging the question for God's sakes, you know, why won't students use this correctly? And at a certain point, begging the question has now acquired the secondary meaning. So this is again, okay. We already discussed pejoration. One more thing to say about this before we move on to the positive, this is duly time, um, is that on the whole semantic changes are either predictably gradual in ways that I'm about to discuss or else unpredictably dramatic. So when a word acquires a totally different kind of new meaning, usually that tends to be very hard to predict. It's the product of a kind of historical accident um, or really clever introduction that caught on. Maybe it's a matter of humor, something funny, um, but mostly semantic change tends to be pretty gradual. Um, so this is some stuff about applying generalizations. So one more little example, I guess, about applying the generalization, the negative lesson of opacity to proposals in the literature. So take a word like, take, take an ameliorative proposal rather like Elizabeth Barnes's on disability. So disabled meaning has a minority body. Is that liable to catch on? Well, let's say it does catch on a little bit. It's pretty theoretically rich. People who aren't already apprised of, of the true view of disability um, are liable to use the term and interpret uses of the term along the lines of say inflammable. They're liable to see the dis and the abled and lexically reinterpret the term. And so activists may need to continually be reminding people what disability really is. Um, it's unlikely that theoretically rich vocabulary is gonna propagate as such in areas of discourse where that theory is not salient as, right, okay. There are examples of this from science, plenty of examples. Um, but Barnes's um, proposal may well get, or a proposal like it may well get lots of traction inside activist circles where there are these shared theoretical aims and commitments. Um, okay. Positive lessons. Here are some ways words tend to change their meaning. And this is, again, all of this is like super well attested in the linguistics literature. I'm not really going out on very many limbs here. Um, uh, and it's worth saying, you can sign on to a lot of this, whether or not you think there are unilateral, unidirectional um, patterns in semantic change. So these, for all I care, are statistical likelihoods given the word stock we're starting out with. I'm not presupposing really all that much about our cognitive architecture. Um, okay, onward. Um, and that would be something we could talk about in Q&A. Maybe you think I am or that I ought to be or, okay. Um, so some positive lessons. When words tend to change their meaning, very often it's they broaden to a generic. Oil originally was a term for olive oil and then broadened, right? Okay, um, to a more generic sort of oil. Um, oil in general, right? Okay, so very often when terms change their meaning, they broaden to a generic or they narrow to an exemplar. Um, so that's fine, but that's not the sort of thing conceptual engineers tend to hope for. Um, in cases of another sort of way words tend to change their meaning is something that you might call responsive narrowing that neo Gricians sort of find particularly interesting because um, it involves semanticizing um, an implicature, basically, or that's what they think. So it goes something like this. English didn't used to have a single word for thumb. Thumbs got called the great finger. Um, when, and finger didn't use, finger just included, you know, all of them. So this is the great finger, the first finger, the, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then thumb entered English through German, from German. And it very quickly became the case that fingered acquired a thumb exclusive meaning where, that's still the case. So we can still talk about our fingers, um, but we can also use the word finger in contrast to thumbs where thumbs are not fingers in this sense. 
Why did this happen? Well, once thumb had entered English, sort of stood to reason that if somebody didn't use the more specific term thumb when they could have, um, that they were not speaking about thumbs. So there was this conventionalized importature, right? Okay. Um, and there are lots of examples like of this, like for instance, cow and bull, bitch and dog. Um, and we could imagine there's, you know, if we wanted woman to mean something like Castlinger's proposal, or if we wanted a term to be in standard usage with something like a meaning subordinated on basis of perceived reproductive capacity, um, we might do better rather than introducing a woman with that meaning and hoping it propagates to introduce say, bitch with the opposite meaning where bitch is a woman who has profited from her perceived reproductive um, capacity. And then we might find ourselves using woman to the exclusion of bitch and it would be conventionalized. Okay, I'm, I'm just playing, but that seems to me actually somewhat more likely than Hasslinger's is that we could get um, division. Okay. Here's, so broadening and narrowing, something that's come up earlier in the conference is this, the, um, I forget what the word that got used for it. Sometimes people call it bleaching where a term broadens to the point of being kind of watered down and diluted. So thing in English, awesome in English, like what does awesome mean? What does that mean anymore? Um, nice um, or perhaps less, less dramatically racist, sexist privilege. <laughs> Um, where terms appear to be acquiring more generic meanings. You think, well, that seems possible, possible and indeed seems to be happening. So I think that's a, um, a kind of case that, that seems quite doable. Um, synonyms have a tendency to differentiate. So if there are two words in a language that really do appear to be true synonyms, usually they'll start acquiring differential associations like trash and garbage, arguably, they're starting to separate. So, you know, one sort of, oh, and another sort of proposal with responsive narrowing to sort of get conceptual engineering going maybe is you start talking about not just recyclables, but also compost. If you could get people to do that more, you might get trash to narrow just to the stuff that goes in the landfill. Um, just a thought, I don't know. So but I think th these are kind of proposals that, um, yeah, okay, so how else do words tend to change their meaning? Well, very often stock metaphors and stock loose speech get semanticized. Um, you've seen some examples of that, like eyes of needles, that was once a metaphor, became a stock metaphor, and now one of the meaning of eye is whole. We talk about the eyes in Swiss cheese, right? Um, and likewise, errors that people are liable to make um, tend to get semanticized, so like begging the question. Um, conventionalized implicatures and so on. But again, there's this sort of question, are the proposals conceptual engineers hoping to propagate, do they fit these models? Do they, are they introduced as, here's, a, you know, here's something that feels metaphorically salient, maybe it'll, maybe it'll take up because that's definitely a pathway to semantic change. And we see tons of that you know, from you know, deontic vocabulary, acquiring modal meanings from, you know, position, you know, positionality in space, acquiring temporal meanings. I mean, that's, those are some of the things that people that are sort of candidates for unidirectional um, semantic change that are sort of cross-linguistically attested and people have sometimes tried to attribute to cognitive architecture, whether or not that's true um, and whether or not that's appropriate to do, I don't know, it's complicated. There are a lot of fights about this sort of thing, um, but we can observe that stock metaphors salient, there tends to be um, stock metaphors, but salient metaphors are more likely to get semanticized. Okay, so positive lessons, again, within small homogenous groups with common concerns and restricted bands of discourse, conceptual engineering proposals seem to be much more feasible. Um, that being said, if we propose to ameliorate um, say the term person within personal identity discourse or truth within, um, you know, discourse about the liar. Um, this isn't very easy either. <laughs> it's, it's not as though that's um, resound, there's been resounding uptake. And moreover, if somebody offers a series of explanations involving um, a, theoretical, a, a theoretical introduction that are not received as explanations of the phenomena we want, that's a problem. 
So we could be like Carballo and talk about, you know, conceptual amelioration informed by the utility, the explanatory utility of the proposals. But if in fact the people um, who are meant to be accepting these sentences and thereby propagating these terms do not receive them as explanatory of the appropriate of the appropriate phenomena, we have a problem and that is a bar to uptake, um, to, to propagation rather. So question, given these negative and positive lessons are the sorts of proposals for conceptual engineering that are feasible um, given a sort of metric of their, you know, potential rewards, um, are they still exciting? Are these things that are still interesting to philosophers? Maybe not to some philosophers. Um, maybe they are. And if they are, um, that's a measure of how seriously people take this project. Um, because if you care about, if you believe that changing um, the mosaic of usage could have positive benefits, um, and you identify some ways to do that, then okay. Is it as philosophically exciting? I think there are lots of really interesting philosophical questions in the vicinity, but the feasibility question to me seems to be um, somewhat empirically tractable. Um, so some takeaways. I think there are some partial answers to the feasibility question. Um, maybe you think my generalizations are wrong. Um, I'd love to know why. Um, I spent a lot of graduate school or the latter part of graduate school reading a ton about this sort of stuff. Um, and it just, it seems like some of these generalizations show up across, you know, lots of these generalizations show up across languages and are discussed across different areas of linguistics as pretty well attested and accepted. Um, and another takeaway, identifying an expression that's more fit for usage, i.e. a better occupant of these, a better satisfier of these many competing communicative pressures, identifying an expression that's better than the ones already occupying um, usage is actually really hard. Um, we just discussed that. And so implementation is gonna require, and this is a point of contact between the last talk and right now is, you know, so implementation is gonna require shifts in the features that drive usage. Um, and that's gonna include shifts in the physical environment and attitudes as well as fashions, saliences, our expectations of our hearers, associated inferences in our own mind, what we expect to be associated in others' minds. Um, and so on. And so I think this, again, so again, I think the proposals that stand to succeed have somewhat different contours than philosophers tend to hope. And that is my talk and I'm looking forward to Q&A. Thanks everybody.